Hi, my name is Christian. I'm a third year med student. Hi, my name is Valerie. I'm a second year PA student. And we're going to take a moment to talk to you about IHSS or Holcomb or idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which is a mouthful. Uh, I'll be starting off just giving you a little bit about the epidemiology as well as uh, the pathophysiology. And then Val's going to go ahead and pick up with uh, some other pertinent information. So basically, as far as the epide epidemiology is concerned, one out of every 200 to 500 adults is suspected to go ahead and have this condition, whether they're aware of it or not. And that translates to about 0.2, 0.5% worldwide. And interestingly enough, many people actually that have IHS, IHSS will go undiagnosed with the condition uh, because it's not uncommon for these people to typically be asymptomatic. Uh, the condition itself, when it's inherited, um, because it can also occur without inheritance, uh, is inherited in an autosom autosomal dominant manner. And there's research has shown that there's a very substantial uh, genetic component to this as well, with uh, over 1,500 different mutations and 11 different genes uh, being identified as potential culprits. So as far as the pathophysiology is concerned, the disease is characterized by hypertrophy of either the left ventricle uh, and or the interventricular septum. And the issue with this is that at higher heart rates, it's possible that diastole or the time um, for the heart to fill during diastole is shortened, which is gonna lead essentially to a, a lowered preload and it's gonna impair the ability of the heart to properly supply both the brain and the rest of the body with proper amounts of perfusion as required by metabolic processes. Uh, it is possible to have uh, an LVOT or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction through the aorta um, as the septum is unusually thick and this is what um, essentially causes like a, a cutoff of the outflow tract if you will. So as far as signs and symptoms go, we'll go ahead and let Val take over from there. All right, when I think of Holcomb, I think of um, <clears throat> when you're doing like a pre-op physical on a younger adolescent uh, before they go and play sports. So hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy can usually present asymptomatic. So patients don't know that they have um, this disease until they're exerting themselves and then they drop, pass out, and then go into cardiac arrest. So it's important, it's very important that we screen for this in any kind of sports physical or before surgeries for adolescents. Other symptoms that you can see are fatigue, um, some shortness of breath on exertion can also be seen, but a lot of the times it is asymptomatic. So to diagnose um, HOCOM, it's good to need to do an EKG and you can see a left, vent left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and when you see that, it is important to follow that up with an echocardiogram. On the echo, you'll be checking out the ventricles as well as the septum. And what they do is they um, look at the thickness. And if the thickness of the ventricular wall or the septum exceeds 15 millimeters, it's diagnostic for HOCO. Um, with those diagnoses, you treat it depending on the severity. So people have mild disease all the way up to very severe disease that doesn't respond well to medications. First, for mild disease, you want to make sure the patient stays very well hydrated and you want to make sure they um, avoid strenuous activity and very uh, strenuous lifting. If they do have a little bit more moderate disease, medications such as beta blockers and calcium channel blockers can be used to slow down the heart um, so that uh, it flows effectively because like Christian said, the um, left ventricle um, has a little bit of difficulty filling because the muscle's so thick, it doesn't allow for dilation to fill with blood. So you, want to, you could use a beta blocker. Um, absolutely contraindicated in, is ACEs and um, nitrates and ARBs in HOCA because you don't want to um, decrease the preload any further since there's already difficulty with diastolic, diastolic filling. Um, if medications like the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers don't work, there is a surgical procedure called a myomectomy. And what happens is the patient will go in and some of the septum can be shaved down. And this is especially helpful for those people who have the hokum with the left ventricular outflow, um, outflow tract obstruction because that'll make it easier for the blood 
to go up through the aorta, circulate, and it'll help increase cardiac output. Um, let's see, some complications that we've seen are, like you said, left ventricular outflow obstruction. There can be some mitral regurgitation. Um, <clears throat> and diastolic yes, dysfunction, diastolic of course. Dysfunction. <clears throat> and the one that they like to test so often on medical and PA boards is sudden cardiac death. Yeah. Um, for example, if somebody does engage in strenuous exercise or is very dehydrated or a combination of both, they essentially have lost all perfusion to their brain and to the rest of their body, which can result in sudden cardiac death. So I forgot to mention physical exam. On physical exam, um, the patient could look pretty normal. When you auscultate the heart, there is a pathognomonic. You could hear the crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur. Heard best at the apex in the left lower sternal left lower sternal border, sternal border, and um, or you could also hear mitral regurgitation. Those are two common things on physical exam that could indicate hokum. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a decent uh, base to start off of your understanding for hokum or IHSS, and we hope you enjoyed this video.